Hey, Mickey, you're wearing a gas mask. Hey, Bob. Makes it harder to hear you. You're rubbing your fists together as if what? You're trying to start a fire without a match? What? You're obviously not up on current events, Bob. Well, that's for sure. The Which, mask represents the threat of radiation from nuclear fallout. <laughs> you, don't yeah, think this is, you don't think this is a radiation-proof mask? No, it looks like it would do the job to me. I think you should send it to somebody in uh, Ukraine near that nuclear power plant. Well, if they hadn't gotten out the gotten the fire out, uh, you know, I might need it, right? Actually, I don't think so. I think the fire was in an administrative building, not very close to the right. But plant. if it had spread, if it spread, it, yeah. People were really worried for like an hour last night. Um, well, even. Uh, I mean, eventually, I want to get into the subject of the media coverage of this whole thing, but. On CNN this morning, I heard that the Russians had, I think this is a quote, set fire to a nuclear power plant, which would be yeah. even more irresponsible than what they did, which is uh, start a firefight on the perimeter of a nuclear power plant and inadvertently ignite an administrative building. Um, there's, a, there's a certain amount of hysteria in the media coverage. It's bad. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, I want to get into this, but. Uh, there's, a, there's a new campaign in Hollywood that I just read about in The Ankler called your business smells russia and, <laughs> and if it and, they, and then you get boycotted and canceled if your business smells russian bob and i think our business smells russian because we have a russian working for us well yeah although uh we may not for long because we can't pay him uh because of the sanctions we okay, try we'll get, uh, we'll get uh, into that yeah um, anyway you also missed what the knuckles were what were the knuckles did you watch Nancy Pelosi in the State of the Union? You know, I she all did I, this really bizarre gesture. What does it mean? She was, who the fuck knows? You know, I, I go ahead. Uh, I think it means that she. I think it means a she, she was drunk, and b, <laughs> and b she it was like Chuck Schumer. He, she wanted to applaud, but then she realized he was talking about burn pits killing his son Bo, in Iraq. Uh, and he, he didn't feel like applauding for that. So he did like this half. That's what I always thing. do when I'm not sure about applause. <laughs> anyway, it was totally bizarre. I skipped pretty much the entire thing. I mean, I did. I did in a moment of weakness, turn it on just to check it out. And what I saw was there was this kid in the gallery. His name was maybe Joshua or something. And, and, the, and, the, and the Chiron said, so and so, comma seventh grader, comma diabetes advocate. You remember right. that part? And I thought, what kind of monster advocates diabetes? And I just shut the thing <laughs> off. No, the the uh, but but uh, that that actually is all I saw. He was a cute kid. He was a cute kid. I, I he was a cute kid, and yeah. Anyway, it was um, there was I didn't think there was anything wrong with the kid. The this the speech was uh, completely. Uh, pedestrian in its writing. It was like the Olympics. This is our moment. This is the moment. We got to make this our moment. It was like, it was, it was, I mean, I can't believe, I I, I, I could, didn't dare go to Jim Fallis's Twitter feed to see how he was going to sell this one as a brilliant example of speech <laughs> writing. Uh, it had, and it had like a, you know, um, well, we can get into it. It had, it had like a, a couple of fake pivots and et cetera, et cetera. A fake what, pivot? What, What's, yeah, a fake, was, what's a fake pivot in a speech? He wanted to pivot. Well, he says he says the borders are secure, which is something he said before, and everybody interprets it that that means he's he's triangulating against the extreme progressives and he's turned the corner on the border and he's going to get tough now. He's pivoted, but he hasn't pivoted. All he said is the borders should be secure. And I have I have chapter and verse of that for later. I, see. I, mean, I know you look forward to it. So a fake pivot is when Mickey thinks he's going to hear something he likes. Uh, when but, Biden says he's pivoted and hasn't pivoted. Yeah, that's it's a I'm, pretty I'm straightforward. I'm I'm sorry. My thoughts and prayers, Mickey. Pretty straightforward definition of a fake pivot. Um. Anyway, what to to my mind the major theme of the day is the conventional wisdom or the CW as we call it has dramatically shifted very rapidly from. Putin's doomed. There's no way he can win. To Putin is going to win. I bet the Baltics are next. I mean, haven't you sensed that? All of a sudden, uh, people are saying, 
oh no, he's going to get away with it. What's to stop him from invading the Balkans? I've been kind of offline today. So if this if this is the, the last eight hours of CW, I'm out of touch with it. I mean, there's been this kind of fear about what's next uh, forever, it seems to me. Uh, uh, I, I don't I think anyone was naive to ever think he was going to lose militarily. As I've said, he's not going to lose militarily. The question no, they didn't is say that. Yeah. The, the the question is, uh, you know, the the post victory resistance, and um, I mean, does he have enough troops to occupy the country and bleed forever while public opinion grows against him back home? Actually, actually, the, the this um this post on comment is freed by a, an eminent British uh, uh, security expert. Did sort of think he was going to. He was not going to. He's going to have to resort to shelling the cities, and he's not going to be able to sustain that. Uh, so he did sort of say he was going to lose, uh, but I don't think people think he's going to lose anymore. Well, he's taking. He's steadily taking ground, and and he's taken a big, uh, a fairly big city, this city of three hundred thousand, Kherson or something, C H E R S O N, and I think the bad the bad news uh, for Ukraine is. Um, you know, the mayor cooperated. Now, this is probably an area with less anti-Russian sentiment than some, but, you know, technically, and I don't mean this judgmentally because I, I don't know what I'd do if I were mayor, but technically it's now a collaborationist government. They're, they're uh, you know, and I haven't heard about any violence encountered by Russian soldiers there. And if that becomes the model, I mean, I think from, you know, from Zelenovsky's point of view, you, you, what you would like is, is, for this to be a different kind of role model for Ru- for the Russian soldiers to run into resistance the first time they take over a city, that that hasn't happened, uh, and um, so that's you know maybe not great. the The other thing is, I I, I think I'm coming to think that the story that I haven't heard much in American media, I finally got it from tapping into some Russian sources. I'll talk about later maybe. Um, I mean, that are available on Twitter, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Kiev, the siege, the imminent siege of Kiev isn't the only big story. Um, and, uh, and neither is the, uh, what's the other, uh, Kharkov or whatever. Yeah. Was- um, the, the Russians are trying to encircle the Ukrainian troops in the Donbass. And apparently if they succeed, that's kind of huge. Because there's like 50, 60, 70,000 of the best Ukrainian troops who are currently in that zone. Now, it's a big zone because apparently taking Kharkov uh, or Kharkiv or whatever, it, you see it's spelled with an I and an O, um, is, uh, is, is, is an important part of that. It's a big circle, but I think that's an important part of what's going on, you know, tactically there, right now. That, that was called by this site called... Russians with attitude a few days ago. Those are that's one they, of my sources. Yes, they, pre- they predicted this. I don't know about that site. They seem pretty pro-Russian. They are. They're I'm, Russians. I'm, they're <laughs> Russians, but they, they could be Russian dissenters. They could be Russian dissenter expatriates, but right. they seem to be actual Russians in Russia. And um, they do report setbacks. They try to be honest, but right. I I do worry that because I linked to them a couple of times that Facebook. And Twitter, the Twitter especially, I guess, is going to somehow decommission me with the algorithm because I'm linking to a pro-Russian site, even though it's not as pro-Russian. It's not a propaganda site, but if it was a propaganda site, it'd be very good, subtle propaganda. Exactly, because because the the strategy seems to be establish your credibility by being factually accurate, but present the Russian point of view. And right, I got to say, keep you know watching them. That Twitter feed, I've listened to their podcast a couple times now. I mean, these are guys who had a Russian history podcast, and then war broke out, and they started tweeting about the war and podcasting about the war. And they're basically, I wouldn't, I don't know if you'd call them pro-invasion. They're fine with it. They are, they call themselves Russian patriots. They're pretty, like, young and hip, right, sounding. And, uh, And you get interesting, I mean, I'll give you an example of a take that, uh, has me, I mean, you know, 
I got to say, as usual these days, I just increasingly wonder who to who to trust. I certainly think the the U.S. media is not doing a great job of recovering covering this from anything remotely like an objective point of view. I mean, certainly cable TV, but even the elite uh, media like the Times, the Post. Anyway, you know the. Uh, this, this is an interesting case study to me. You know, in, in Kharkiv or however we're going to pronounce it, one of the first things, one of the first big strikes that got a lot of adverse publicity for Russia was on this. It was called a town hall, an administrative building, whatever, on Freedom Square or something. Do you remember this? It, it was, it was, and then that same day, Vaguely, I think, yeah. I think uh, some more uh, clearly residential area was hit maybe. Right. Anyway, got a lot of publicity everywhere in the Western media it was it was described as uh you know as a town hall or something an administrative building uh these guys pointed out you know there was a blue and yellow in ukrainian colors big big tent in front of the building and the bomb the missile had actually landed kind of between the tent and the building kind of on the front door the doorstep of the building right. about 20 yards from the tent and they said that this tent is a recruiting station for the azov brigade or azov regiment right. Now, I had not really heard of that. You probably have, right? I had heard of it because I read that site, and they're the they're the fascists who were on the Ukrainian right. side. Right. So you look it up in Wikipedia, and the Azov Brigade is this thing that is known to to is identified on 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 Wikipedia as a right wing extre extremist and neo Nazi unit of the National Guard of Ukraine. They were originally a paramilitary group in 2014, uh, and then they were integrated into the. Uh, government's forces, the government, I'm sure, would tell you that, well, you know, the, not not so many neo-Nazis in it these days. But what's becoming clear is that, I mean, first of all, it, that would be interesting information, right, for the U.S. media to report. And I wonder if they know it, but they're reluctant to get into that because we're supposed to stick with this narrative that, that Putin is 100 percent hallucinating about neo-Nazis. But you know, it's it's it, it's important. Oh, the other thing is it turned out, according to these guys, that the administration building had become a military headquarters. So in this account, it was, the, you know, the bomb landed in between a, a neo-Nazi. Why would you have a military headquarters in a tent if you have a building nearby? No, no, no. The, no, no, no the military headquarters had become the build. The building oh, was now okay. military. Uh, okay. The tent. And and there and apparently, uh, you know, the Azov Brigade had said, yeah, we're recruiting here. They should, you know, there were posters and everything. It was known. Okay. So, I mean, who knows, but I, I'd like to read more about the Azov Brigade in the Western media, because after listening to these guys, it's clear, A, that that's, this is a lot of what Putin has in mind when he talks about these neo-Nazis, and he's really focused on them. These guys were saying that in the negotiations to create a corridor uh, for civilians, the Russians wanted to maintain control of the corridor just so they could check for Azov Brigade guys because and i think the the actual reason is they would be the heart of the resistance these guys would be the last guys to say die i mean i don't know how how neo nazi now, they are now you people. know why they were integrated into the military well right and but, um, but according to these guys they do horrible things yeah. they they yeah. people trying to flee the donbass for their safety are are dragged out of their cars by these guys and so on i i don't I don't you, know, but I'm convinced that the U.S. is not doing you, a great job. Well, yeah, but you know that Putin would harp on that because that's a good point for him, right? I mean, he's not. It doesn't mean that that's why he invaded. That oh no, mean no, that, no. It doesn't mean that he himself is obsessed with denazification. Not, but it's I'm, a very convenient point to say uh, you have to denazify. Right. My point is just that to hear a lot of the media coverage, you'd think that he's just hallucinating. There are no neo-Nazis right, right. associated with the government right, at all. Right, right, right. And look, uh, you know, I, I can already, you know, feel the blowback in the comments section. I just want to emphasize, nothing I say is meant to defend Putin, blah, blah, blah. We're trying to explain well, why things happen and get as clear a view as possible of what the hell is happening. And you need diverse media sources to 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 figure that out. Um. um. The uh, the um, let's assume that he does sort of get bogged down, and there, you know, that uh, the the viewpoint from two days ago, and there, everybody had everybody sort of weighed in with their options, and they were all exactly the same, which is that the by far the best thing is some sort of deal, uh, a dirty deal, as Tom Friedman said, where you know they, they agree not to 
not to join NATO and, uh, uh, you know, they give the Donbass and Crimea to Russia, or the least parts of it. And somehow Friedman said that this was like hard for Putin to accept. It seems to me that's easy for Putin to accept. Uh, and that should be the deal. Done. And, and actually, there was a, a, a story today that uh, Putin had actually, in a call with somebody, the German chancellor, uh, had uh, uh, the prime minister, one of the, the whoever whoever the head of Germany is, uh, had actually proposed Schultz, such a deal. Schultz, Schultz. Schultz. Yeah. And and I say, fine, take it, grab it, ram it down Zelensky's throat. Um, I'm not. They said Putin had actually offered something like that. Yeah, there was a story about an hour ago. So I what? Don't believe he'd, it. he'd want Crimea and the Donbass and the and the land. He hasn't secured the land bridge yet, but he's closing in on it. They didn't mention the land bridge, but they 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 said some sort of, you mm -hmm. know, uh, neutralization and denazification. I mean, uh, uh, so yeah. so in this case, this goes beyond what we probably could have gotten him to not invade for, which is the Minsk deal plus neutralization. This would be. I Recognizing the independence of the Donbass or else their annexation by Russia is the idea. I think so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, 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 but I don't know. I don't know if it's the whole area or only the one third that are Russian. And and we did have a, a, a comment by Lauren Ruzikas, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who claimed that it's false to think that all the Russian speakers in the Donbass are actually anti Ukraine, pro Russia, that there's been a shift. Uh, they're now a lot of them are pro Ukraine. So Russia's grabbing it while they can, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I I mean, we'll see. It, it 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 it's hard to say what's going on in in Putin's mind. What he settled for. Uh, the um, and, and I don't I don't see Zelensky buying that, except under a huge amount of pressure. To, to his line has been he wouldn't even give away. Crimea. Um, well, that's that's sort of silly. He's about to get crushed. You would think he would know that. Now, there are people who ask, including these Russians with attitudes guys, is he in fact still in Kiev? You know, we haven't seen local scenery in a video in a while, right? He's um he's taking a trip to uh to some conference, I think. Oh, is that what he said? No, I just read that. Uh, some some sort of NATO European conference, and I He'd be a fool to return from that, basically. Yeah, and I I, and I think, um, but, uh, and and that will change his perspective. I mean, I think if he's in Kiev, he'd be more ready to deal under the pressure of the assault than he will be if he's, you know, viewing it remotely. Huh, huh. But because because he's worried about actually getting killed. Yeah, and, and well, and and uh, and if he's abroad, he can say, okay, melt back into the countryside, time for the resistance, and not take the deal. Uh, and maybe that's a rational strategy if he. Uh, I guess, but the deal seems this deal seems awfully good, and everybody's sort of throwing up obstacles. Oh, they're not going to take it. They're not going to take it. Well, uh, it you know it and it does depend on the military facts on the ground. If the Russians are winning, they probably won't take it. But, I mean, uh, the reason I'm skeptical about a deal. One reason is you know usually the way these deals happen is you have a ceasefire, takes a while to work out the deal. Um, and I don't see Russia putting up with a ceasefire of much duration precisely because supposedly all of these weapons are coming in even as we speak, right? I mean, I don't know what the pace is, whether many have come in, whether more are coming in. But if I'm Russian, I hear that every European nation wants to flood Ukraine with weapons. I'm like, let's get this shit over with. Every day of a ceasefire, the odds get worse, right? I mean, I don't think they can, they can uh, get a guarantee that they would believe that that you're going to freeze the weapons uh flow well, or anything if his strategy is to shell the cities from afar and not take them uh that takes a while so he's he's screwed because it'll be delayed you know anyway yeah i don't know i think we're going to see more and more air power used apparently they, they do the russians do seem to own the skies pretty much every well, once in a while you hear about a a drone a ukrainian drone uh doing well, that, something but that was the, you know, people say they don't own the skies, and then they say, well, why has, hasn't the Ukrainian Air Force taken out this convoy? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you if you remember the Kosovo War, that convoy would be gone in an hour. I mean, they just the NATO plane comes along with they you we have these super weapons that just 
boom, 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 take out every truck in the convoy. And uh, the, the Ukrainians aren't doing any of that, even if well, they they've don't done have a, the They've done weapons. a tiny bit of it, but but I, I think Not they're... Not the air, I don't think. Maybe yeah, the no, air, there was... Uh, I, I, I saw... Um, the, the one at least one hit by a jet and one hit by a drone i don't i don't know if the drone one was this convoy but but the jet one was i think but 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 we're talking about hundreds of vehicles i mean you got to you know this is and, and it's the same with these you know you keep seeing these encouraging pictures of abandoned or or wiped out russian tanks right. but you add them all up and it's not that many and you never right. see a whole bunch in a row you see two or three in a row you never right. see a wipeout Right. And, right. And, and in Kosovo, we saw a wipeout. Yeah, that's what you need pretty, to see. Pretty horrifying. Um, the uh, so if if um, I I don't quite understand where he gets the troops for uh, a pacifying Ukraine and b moving on to another country. Uh, does he have? I mean, he supposedly doesn't have enough troops even to occupy Ukraine. So how does he move on to the Baltic? I don't think he's going to move on to the Baltics. Well, you didn't think he was going to take you Kiev either, Bob. Well, nobody did. Nobody did. And and I mean, I'll tell uh, wait you. Wait a minute. Let's go. I, I I said all this standing between him is a big lake. Remember, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I thought he was. You were saying all those standing between Kiev and Russia was a big lake, and it turned out you were talking yeah. about Belarus. That said, he did have troops in Belarus. But, oh, he had troops in Belarus. Big but deal. um. I mean, first of all, remember, there are NATO, you know, those are NATO countries. Those are NATO countries. Okay. But, that's but, a, but, but yeah, but so he calls NATO's bluff. That's the big, that's the big deal here. I mean, he calls NATO bluff. Are we going to go to war over Lithuania? And Bob, are you going to go to war over Lithuania? I've what already, say, I've what already, say, uh, what do you say when he does that? No, I think you have to fight back. I, I think I, I, I take alliances seriously. I mean, that's why we shouldn't have expanded NATO. It's not a fucking joke. Right. You're saying you'll go to war for them, but once you, I, I am in favor of honoring treaties, and and and, but but that's why I don't advocate entering into them casually the way the way American presidents. Right. Okay, so so he invades do. Lithuania, and we have a land war, and hope it doesn't go nuclear. Is that the story? Yeah, that's like, what like you have to do. Like, like China versus India. I mean, I guess it's been done. Well, China versus India, they didn't even use guns. You mean that most recent dust-up uh, yeah. months but, ago? Yeah, I mean, well, they've had a lot of dust-ups, but yeah. yeah. I mean, that was interesting, though, because there was an agreement not to introduce firearms to the area. And indeed, they didn't. They just, like, the Chinese, like, like beat them over the head with shovels and stuff. But they they killed some of them. But um, anyway, the uh, he's not going to – no, I mean, I mean, you know, he's not – I still think he's not crazy. I heard an interesting uh, interview with this uh, – this oligarch named, I think, what is it, Zirakovsky or something. He was a guy that Putin had put in jail years ago. He was the first oligarch who got so big for his britches that Putin dealt with him like that, I think. And now he's in Europe, but he apparently knows Putin pretty well. And what he said is, uh, no, Putin's not crazy, but he's let himself get in an information cocoon, and he really thought the troops would be greeted as liberators. And that explains Kiev. He didn't plan to have to occupy Kiev. I was right about that. But he he thought uh, it would be a simple decapitation. But now I think uh, he would have to occupy it. And and I don't know how he's grappling with that fact. That's hard to believe he's that cocoon. That's awfully cocoon. Well, look, no, but you can the na look at the nature of the original operation. They flew these troops into the airport near Kiev and... It seems, I, I think a lot of military experts say that it looks as if they thought they could do Kiev without a massive force. And then, the, and then the airport thing was repelled by the Ukrainians, so that didn't work out. And then they're like, I, I mean, look, you know, the well, fact that we, they hadn't even told the these troops that they were going to have to fight a war. I, 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 was, I guess I was going to say that... Uh, that was like our attack on Baghdad. Remember, we sent one very fast column through, and uh, and it was it was it appeared behind Baghdad Bob as he was saying there were no American troops in Baghdad, and um, uh, but that was way beyond when we thought we were going to be greeted as liberators, wasn't it? Or maybe we thought we were maybe we thought. You mean in two thousand in two thousand three? Yeah. 
Oh, I think we, when we got to Baghdad, we thought we had been greeted as liberators. Huh. Um, okay. Well, that 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 dovetails with your theory then. Uh, that was um, in in this British guy, Friedland, Friedman, Freeland. In a uh, comet is freed. It's a Substack. It's free. Uh, that was uh, that was Plan A. Plan A was the quick, the quick strike with a small group, and I guess it was that dovetails with being greeted as liberators. Plan B is you send the convoys and you hope to capture the cities. Plan C is that doesn't work, so you just shell the cities in a submission. And he thought that wouldn't work, and I think the jury is out. And Plan yeah. D is I don't know what the fuck food will do, but all bets are off. Maybe he'll be, maybe there'll be a coup against him. Um, I mean, I don't, and I will say, I mean, I, I feel less inclined than ever to try to predict what's going to happen, partly just because, you know, I've been humbled by what has happened, but also, honestly, listening to these Russians with attitudes, guys, uh, and, 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 and hearing how different their whole story is in terms of uh, I, I mean, I don't think I don't think their perspective is right either. But a, a number of things, including them, has really reminded me of how far from objective most of the Western coverage is. And it's made me wonder in the run up to this, as I was assuming, yes, in the end, there will be massive uh, resistance um, in, in Kiev and so on. You couldn't possibly successfully occupy it. You know, was I buying into some Western narrative too much, a narrative that maybe isn't isn't as rooted in reality? And God knows you can't tell, you know, anything from what's going on now. Ukraine has a very effective, in you know, psyops, you know, I mean, they're good with the information. And and but I have no idea what's actually going on on the ground. But uh, so you think there's a possibility that they occupy the country and there isn't? A resistance and no, I, I don't. Well, certainly not the whole country, not not west of Kiev. I mean, remember, you know, there were a number of people uh, saying they might try for everything to the east and south of Kiev, including Odessa. There were people saying that that was not being ruled out. Right. What was being what was being ruled out was everything, pretty much everything west of the Dnieper River and Kiev. Now, so far. The only thing that it's clear that the consensus was wrong about is Keith, because he doesn't have troops trying to, you know, uh, you know, I mean, they, they bombed west of the Dnieper, but they're not doing much with troops there. And that's why I, I don't know what he has in mind at this. Does he have in mind partition or what? But again, I think, the, you know, uh, the, they but should, Ukrainians should worry if if they keep taking cities and uh, the local government cooperates. I mean, what, I think what the Ukrainians need is a precedent of violent resistance. Well, that's what's happening in the second, in Kharkiv or whatever you, is it? I mean, well, no, but they haven't occupied it yet. I mean, the military is resisting in Kharkiv. Right. I mean, once they've won militarily. I think they have a mayor who's resisting, don't they? Well, the other mayor was resisting until yeah, until the okay. Russians showed yeah, up, okay. and then well, and then the he, and then he and then he said, "Yes, it's true that the Russians are here, but the Ukrainian flag is still flying above me." Yeah, that's the bad news because that means you are now a collaborationist. <laughs> I mean, they're running the but, city. Um, uh, Again, I don't mean I, that, always, I really don't mean that like ne you know negatively. Did, it's like, didn't he tell Macron that he wants the whole enchilada or the whole chalupa, as you might say? I don't know. You missed my chalupa joke. What? What is? Remind Long me. What, in the planning. What is a chalupa? The leading Ukraine agitator in the Democratic Party has the bizarre name of a Mexican dish. Chalupa. Her name is, Ch Her name is chalupa. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. You you need somebody uh, somebody more up to your speed than me. Anyway, uh, the this talk this this talk. I at first I thought this talk all this talk about how. You know, some Russian general is going to pull his sidearm on on Putin and take him out, or you know, the oligarchs are going to gang up against him and there's going to be a coup. Um, I always thought that was wishful thinking, and then I thought, well, no, that's a strategy. They're trying to scare Putin somehow if he reads this sort of thing into being a paranoid about those around him. And and then I thought, is that a good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> because uh, right. A paranoid right. Putin might might uh, you know might make a horrible mistake, 
or he might start a nuclear war. We don't know, right? Right. And I mean, in a way, the same is true of the sanctions regime more broadly. Uh, that's the kind of thing that could make him more well, paranoid the, in a couple the, of ways. The, the, the interesting thing is, if you believe this, out, this outfit, Euro Intelligence, which is run by a, a former Financial Times part, uh, columnist called Wolfgang Munchau, I think. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, he claims the sanctions, are, sanctions are, are completely riddled with loopholes. The, uh, the SWIFT sanction, he claims, has fallen apart. It now only applies to seven banks, 25% of the banking system. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, bank, the, uh, there, it also may uh, at some point, uh, real, the West will realize that nobody will want to do banking with them ever again if they're like, they're like Facebook now. If they don't like you, they, they, they fuck you and, you know, they're like, they're like uh, Justin Trudeau. If they don't like you, they freeze your account. Well, who would want to bank in Canada after that? Who wants to use our SWIFT system if, if it can be, you know, the oh, that, That's long been correct. a problem. Okay. I mean, we've been, we've been abusing our centrality to the yeah. world financial system for sanctions purposes for a long time, and it's bound to catch up with yeah. us. I think it has been in some ways. Yeah. China has started they, a kind of alternative. Yeah. Yeah. And they have, they also, when I was still buying their oil. So it can't both be true that the sanctions are failing and that he's quartered. Pick what you know. Pick one or the other. Uh, I, I, you know, either, to the extent the sanctions are failing, we don't have him cornered. We don't have to worry about what he's going to do if he's cornered. Well, it depends. I mean, there's two levels of the sanctions. There's the one that are target, targeting the whole economy, and the ones that are supposedly targeting the oligarchs, who supposedly are going to team up and uh, depose him. But I mean, first of all. What's a few billion to these guys? You know, <laughs> there are other yachts in the world, uh, and uh, I don't know. But all I know is that uh, when we tried to uh, pay Nikita, it didn't work, and then so we went back and tried to set up the account all over again. And it says, "Pick the country this is going to," and Russia is no longer on the menu of options. This is Bank of America. Oh well, I mean, whereas a week ago Russia was on the menu of options for Bank of America. Well, Bank of America would be probably, they might be doing that just for American public opinion. Who knows? They won't necessarily be doing that because they are, because of the official section. But they're only 25%, Bob. You got to try the other 75%. I'll tell him. I think Nikita, Nikita should be able to find that. Get, get, hook Nikita up with Russians with attitude. I was going to ask him about they'll, them. They'll, they're, they're, they'll they're definitely, figure out how to do it. They're definitely not in exactly his cultural milieu, but I was, I was curious as to his take on them. Oh, it's a, is this is this good? No, go ahead. Is this true of every reporter in America? They're not being paid. I guess they get it deposited in their bank accounts at home, because they would have figured out a way, right? They have mean, to pay people. He, they have to pay interpreters. They have to pay taxi drivers. You mean who? They American businesses that American are journalists, people? American journalists in in Ukraine must have figured out a way around this sanction. Well, I think Ukraine's okay. It's just Russia. I mean. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. We like yeah. well, Ukraine is our friend, Mickey. We have journalists in Russia too, though. You may have noticed this distinction between the way Russia is being depicted and the way Ukraine is being depicted in the American media. It's subtle, but you know, if you're it's, really it's completely out of control. It's 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 like it's like NBC. I was watching NBC's re reaction to the State of the Union. They spoke, why did he spend all the time on Ukraine? Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. They desperately wanted Biden to go like 90 minutes on Ukraine and completely ignore his domestic priorities, which would have been insane. No, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing. It's like, uh, I heard on CNN this morning, um, first they interview, uh, some ambassador or something from Ukraine. And they're like, wouldn't you like a no fly zone? Wouldn't you like a no fly zone? And then they interview somebody from like the state department. Like, why is there no fly zone? Why is there no fly zone? And then like what? a couple, yeah, totally. Uh, that, that I, I mean, it's like, uh, and and then uh, Sunday, I, I think on CNN, Dana Bash is interviewing uh, Mitt Romney, and this is this is a subtle thing that is so typical of the blob, to which both Dana Bash and Mitt Romney, in effect, belong. Uh, but but she's like, in retrospect, don't do you think Biden really should have ruled out sending American ground troops into Ukraine? Now, one might have asked, in retrospect. Do you think we should have tried harder to get a diplomatic solution that would be 
more favorable than anything we're going to get now without the fucking war and without setting the precedent of rewarding an invasion and all that. She could have asked that, but they would never ask that. They would ne- I, no American reporter would ask I think that. I, fi- I think I figured out a reason why you might not want to make an offer before the, you know, everybody say, well, you know, if, if we agree to this deal now, why didn't we agree to it before? Uh, and I think the answer is that if we offered it before and it had been rejected, then that becomes sort of a floor. Putin can't then agree to that deal after a war without losing face and say, well, I could have gotten this before. I got to get something for invading this fucking country. Uh, so it sort of becomes a, uh, it, it sort of raises the, the 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 bar of the deal that Putin will accept after he's invaded. Wait a Does second. Does that make any sense at all? I missed it because my dog started whining okay. and, and there's okay. nobody else at home and I was afraid he was in pain, but he stopped. So go ahead. Uh, if, okay. if you'll just repeat that and our listeners will indulge us. Maybe it's just an I want a, I want a hug whine. Maybe that's it. And that's Frazier. Uh, Frazier never wants a <laughs> hug. <laughs> Milo, maybe. Anyway, um, he, suppose we, we had offered publicly, you know, in, in a way that became, we had offered, definitely offered a deal of, you know, you get part of the Donbass and you get Guarantee not to join NATO, okay? Before, uh, and if Putin accepts it, that's great. Then we've averted a war. If Putin rejects it, though, then if he starts an invasion, he's never going to then accept that because he say he'll in his mind he says, "Well, I could have had that before the war. Now I have to have something more than that. So it has to be, you know, Donbass and well, I think that's the NATO case. And something else, and so, but that's why we wouldn't. That's why it, it, it that's a rational reason not to make that offer explicit because it becomes a floor that Putin has to surpass then in any subsequent deal. Yeah, but we don't want him to have to surpass it. We want him to accept the, uh, you know, the- Right, that's why you don't make it. So you don't make it and then he goes to war, you offer him the deal you would offer him anyway and he does- And and now he he doesn't take it. That's why you should- No, he would take it because he hadn't rejected it already. Oh, they, well, I, I got, well, I got this thing, you know, and and well, uh, but but there's no way he's he gonna, doesn't need deal plus one. He can take the deal. There's no way he's going to. But there's no way he's going to take the deal that I think maybe we could have. Now, I would I, I would say after his pre-invasion semi unhinged speech and after the invasion itself, I I've raised, uh, you know, the, the level of what I think we would have had to give him. I no longer think we could have fudged the issue at all. But I think you certainly could have, well, I think there's a good chance you could have gotten away without giving him anything. I think, I think you, you could have uh, offered him the Minsk Accords, which would mean autonomy for the two, uh, two provinces in the Donbass and, and, in effect, give them veto power on, on, on some future things. Uh, and also an explicit guarantee uh, would, about, about if, stopping NATO enlargement. But If I were Zelensky, I'd much rather just give him the territory and, and not give them a veto power. Yeah, but leaders never think about that. I, I mean, I, they don't think that way. Politicians get punished for giving away territory. It, it just it just seems not to, you know, be something they look forward to. There's all kinds of situations where the country would be better off just giving the territory. Czechoslovakia but, did that, didn't they? Well, ultimately. Czechoslovakia wanted to secede and they said, okay, you have a vote. Yeah, that was a peaceful, we're, that was a peaceful we're sorry, secession. We're sorry you're seceding. We think it's a mistake, but go ahead. <laughs> you mean you mean the Czech said that to the, the Slovaks? Slovaks? To the Slovaks, yeah, I think. Yeah, well, I happened. think that's because they secretly considered themselves too good for the Slovaks, right? <laughs> right. Well, and were you about to say, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. I, that's no, my best friends no, right. But th- um, that's um, um, you know, maybe maybe that the Ukrainians secretly considered themselves better than the Russians, probably, right? Uh, that's a good Bizarre. question. Bizarrely, since they started off at the bottom, if you believe Ann Applebaum. Yeah, I think some I like, Russians. I like the Czechs who've always, I think, thought themselves superior to the Slovaks. But um, I don't know. I think culturally, there. I think some Russians consider the the, the U- Ukrainians primitive. But I, I think a lot of Ukrainians, uh, I, I think for a lot of them, it's just they don't want to live under the Russian government. Yeah. Um, uh, so what about the the third alternative which is Putin is just playing us he's decided we're weak he looks at Afghanistan he looks at the failure to uh, 
come out against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. However important it was, it could be a sign of weakness that Biden said, go ahead, don't lift the sanctions on it. Uh, and he, he, he looks at, you know, the, he looks at the unwillingness to commit troops and he says, I can now roll these guys. Uh, and, 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 he, and he not only takes, and so he is going to go in the Balkans, he is going to call NATO's bluff. And, you know, he may be cocooned. He's cocooned enough to think he's going to be welcomed as liberated. He's cocooned enough to think he can call NATO's bluff in the Baltics. And that's a fucking disaster. Well, I, I just don't. I, I think then you could start talking seriously about him being crazy. But the. Um, Maybe he's not crazy. I don't think be, he is crazy. That's my point. You think, you think he can't beat us conventionally in the Balkans? We'd have to escalate. We'd have to be the well, one. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You'd have to understand. We would have to save face. It could become all-out war. And if we marshal all of NATO's resources, I mean, I mean, first of all, if he's rational, he doesn't court the risk of nuclear war that way. Uh, but secondly, could he? I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert, but I suspect that in the long run, we could more or less completely destroy his military. I mean, uh, you know, they're not that looking that great. I doubt with the troops that we have in NATO now, we'd have to bring over some other troops. But I think our jets, I think our jets are probably better than theirs. I think our technology is better than theirs. And a, a lot of it is technology these days. It it certainly looks that way from reading all the reports, but that, that was from the old conventional wisdom where he was losing to the doughty Ukrainian resistors. Now the new the new conventional wisdom is, well, he, you know, he's gonna get the job done anyway. Um it's that, so, was a, that was a conventional wisdom all along uh, uh, among the real experts is that militarily, if you don't do a no fly zone, which I think would be crazy, he prevails. I thought he I thought, that, you know, they, they've been in wars. We haven't. They're they're that type of war. They're probably they've re rejiggered their command and control. They, you know, they, they, they they're not as stodgy as, as they were before. And it turns out that's not true. Then you're probably right. Um, mm -hmm. But. Uh, yeah, I I don't have a hell of a lot of faith in our military either. Oh, no, I, I don't know. I think our I think our military is pretty damn impressive. We have we have had experience in combat recently. Oh, I think we have superior technology and 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 it's looking like superior training. Plus, we have this practice, which is before you send troops into a war, explain to them they're going into a war. <laughs> it's not, you know. I well, mean, it's a, it's a whole maneuverability, flexibility. Uh, uh, revolution that was initiated by the people that Jim Fallows wrote about. The revolution in, in military in affairs, defense. guys. Well, I don't know. It's like Pierre Spray, now a you know a mm. recording engineer. Uh, you know James Boyd is the hero of of those people. Uh, you know we 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 can change we can change strategy on the battlefield faster than they can, and if we get inside their decision loop, we win, Bob. No, I think I think, I think we would ultimately I think we would ultimately win, but but uh, it's scary as shit. Keeping it non-nuclear and, and it's just I don't want to do it, and that's why I think Putin would have to be crazy to invade a NATO state. I mean, especially since what he did in Ukraine has led us to put a bigger tripwires, you know, real troops, uh, you know, in non-trivial numbers in uh, in I think all the NATO states now. And plus, remember he he's he's gotten some negative reinforcement. He he's you know, his hubris has has uh, run into some resistance. Uh, I, I think even the the Russians with attitudes guys wouldn't say uh, that he hasn't that things went quite as well as he thought they would. And I certainly don't think he anticipated the European Union voting unanimously to send weapons to Ukraine. And I don't think he he probably didn't anticipate how draconian the sanctions. We're going to be, although I think in his worldview, we're ultimately going to sanction the hell out of him anyway. You know, he's the, he just feels like they're trying to exclude me from the world. That's what they're going to try. And I'm going to show them. In, 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 our, in, our, in, in the deal that would I think both you and I think is the best solution to this, do, are we OK with uh, saying that Ukraine will never join the EU? I am, but. You know, uh, I. I, I Look, if it if it brought an end to this, I suppose so. It's for the EU, EU to say back, you know, in 2014, apparently. 
you know, the, the, the big issue then was Ukraine seeking this kind of intermediate membership, this uh, right. associate membership. Thing. And, and Putin said, you know, be- because an implication of that was to uh, make some of the economic ties of Ukraine to Russia less strong and less robust. There was going to be Russia was going to pay a price. And Russia said to the Ukraine, we work out some kind of deal where there's some kind of special status for Ukraine. And it's like not too hard on us and it works for you. Can we talk about that? And my understanding is the EU said, you know, take a hike. You're just Vladimir Putin. Fuck you. They didn't say exactly that. I thought I thought the the president of uh, Ukraine at the time had cut a deal with the EU and Russia had to bribe him to come off it. And then he took the Russian deal. Yeah, he and, was he and was then leaning, the Maidan revolution happened. Right. He was leaning toward the associate membership thing I, I don't know if, if the russians bribed him personally they i wouldn't put it past no, him but, I, I, but, that's not what i was saying I just, no no they definitely offered actual subsidies money to the state yeah. of ukraine and 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 that was and 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 he changed his mind but, i don't know what was going on but so that implies the eu was had been responsive because otherwise he would never have had to be bribed with no no, no 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 the eu was fine with Ukraine getting this associate membership. Putin oh, okay. said, wait a second, that hurts Russia. Can we work out a deal where they have a slightly different status with the EU that doesn't entail severing certain economic ties with Russia right. or raising certain tariffs with Russia or whatever it was? And they said, oh, no, see. we're not willing to talk about that. That's oh, I see. Okay. my understanding. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's interesting. It was not what, widely reported. What about, that's interesting. What about that makes the whole thing look worse? Um, the whole thing. The more you look at it, the what more uh, it looks. the whole twenty fourteen business. Yeah. What do um, what what is the I uh, the other thing I need explained to me is what the effect of the Iran talks is, because my impression is we're about to cut a deal to restore the treaty, and Russia is a huge help in that. Right. But so is there a quid pro quo there? Uh, how why would Russia be help us if we're about to you know? launch a war against them i don't understand it well uh i've been wondering the exact same thing i mean isn't there some point beyond which relations get so strained that you just can't get them to buy into things like the iran deal i mean they have their own set of incentives they would they don't want iran to have nuclear weapons on the other hand i assume they welcome iran's oil having trouble getting into the marketplace because that keeps oil prices higher than they would be otherwise so uh, but I, I I really don't know the I mean the, the the other big interesting player of course is China and you know the Wall Street Journal says that China is not happy with the invasion because they are kind of being linked to it by virtue of that little uh, photo op that Xi Jinping and Putin did at the Olympics and and the joint uh, statement they issued uh, against NATO expansion although it didn't mention Ukraine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, they're the ones by virtue of these sanctions, China has a huge amount of leverage with Russia because if they don't buy Russia's stuff and don't sell Russia's stuff, Russia is in trouble. Um, the, uh, and I, it's, it'll be interesting to see if they use it in a way that is from our point of view, constructive. I think it would be a good time for us to have a conversation with China and suggest that maybe we're going to be a little less hard on them in the future in certain ways, the way the ways that have driven them crazy. This Wall Street Journal piece, by the way, also said that what drove certainly influenced China's decision making on whether to do this this big joint declaration with Putin at the Olympics was exactly what they saw as the antagonism coming from the U.S., not showing up for the Olympics, having that summit of democracies. Those are the two things the journal piece mentioned. Those were happening in the run-up to the Olympics, and they helped persuade Xi Jinping that he wanted to get together with Putin and hold hands and express, you know, his undying friendship. So I, I've been saying this all along. Okay, we have been driving Russia and China together. There is there there is that raises the whole issue that um, uh, you 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 read these commentaries as a, as a and I'm not a foreign policy guy, they they say, a lot of them include, oh, okay, we obviously frittered away the chance 
we and Mearsheimer says this, we frittered away the chance we had at the end of the Cold War when we were the un, you know allegedly the unipower. Uh, uh, we frittered away from from that time to now. Obviously, we should have done things different. Now we're fucked. Um, and obviously, the two things that leap out to me that we should have done different is one somehow managed the transition to capitalism in Russia that so it wasn't the economy wasn't immediately taken over by oligarchs. So everybody there has an incredibly sour taste about what happened after the Cold War. And what was Jeffrey Sachs doing there? And did he do any good? And 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 two, uh just an elemental question of respect. I mean, we seem determined not not to give Putin any respect anywhere and to treat him as like a banana republic with nuclear weapons and somehow we weren't scared of him and and we sort of rubbed his face in it and that was obviously a mistake but aside from that what what did we do wrong what should we have done well it's like aside from that how would you like to play mrs lincoln i mean the last thing you said you know showing him disrespect it wasn't just the the occasional not giving him a good seat at a conference from his point of view it was completely relentless starting with the the bombing of Serbia without, you know, Security Council permission, you know, a Slavic country, a friend of Russia's. Yeltsin went ballistic over that. And Putin was at that point in Yeltsin's administration. OK, that is the beginning. And that was NATO. This is after we've said we're going to expand NATO. OK. And oh, this, by the way, this is what we're going to use NATO for to, to attack whatever fucking Slavic country we want to attack. That's the way they took it. And and they, they they really didn't like it. And so when uh, NATO did expand, it formally expanded its mission at the time, right? It, exactly. It did both things. Yeah. It said yeah. we're gonna we're gonna do out of we're gonna do things other than collective defense, which I thought is what NATO was about. Right. And and uh and by the way, we're going to expand. Um, and then you know, uh there was a lot of stuff in two in 2008. Bush makes that declaration, we're gonna include Georgia and Ukraine. Drove him completely nuts. And this was after Putin's warning in 2007. We can only accept so much in the way of NATO expansion was, and, 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 and things like Kosovo. You we know, had, yeah. We had pretty clearly done the frittering at that point. I mean, by 2008. Yeah, but then it got worse. I mean, people, it had been frittered. people have, you know, no idea what, what the 2014 thing looked like from Russia's point of view. And then, you know, the whole, the whole, the, what looks to them, not implausibly, like a U.S. sponsored coup. And, and the, uh, I'm not saying it, it, that is the accurate description. That, that's sort of my impression of it. That that's... it is an accurate description. Well, you can argue, but, but my point is most Americans have no fucking idea what was going on in 2014 in Ukraine with us literally deciding who we wanted the successor to be once we got this pesky get... democratically elected president. I posed. I guess it depends on how how much, in part, on how much NGO money we were pumping in to keep the Maidan people going. Uh, I, don't I assume know, there was that, a lot of it, but maybe the I'm one wrong. phone call that the Russians taped is just, you know, again oh, from that their was, point that, of view. If, if, if that could just be her speculating on who he wanted to no, be. Go minister, listen right? to it. No, go listen to it. It's they picked the guy. They have a discussion. Who should it be? Who should it be? Yaz is our guy. They're picking actually the next prime minister, not strictly speaking, the successor. And they say, okay, what do we do now? Well, we got to get a big international figure to come in and validate him. We got to do this. There's some reference to we got to get Biden to give him an attaboy or something. I mean, they, they clearly are under the impression that they get the, America gets to pick the guy and they have a, and I think they say, you know, this may not work or something. You know, it's not like they're sure of it, but they think it's like their mission. To select an anti-Russian uh, Ukrainian leader well, and it, and and to help depose the fucking president. Well, no, I, I I agree with you, but it just seems it, it's a big difference between, uh, you know, th overthrowing our bends. I bet we didn't say, well, we might not get away with it. <laughs> um, uh, well, no, the, yeah, uh, it isn't. You quite, know, we had the guy lined up. It's it's and, not it's not that level. It, no, it's it's not what we do uh, maybe in our own hemisphere. But uh, you know, it, it's again, if Russia did anything remotely like this in Mexico, and, and then the next thing they did, let's suppose he did this in Mexico. Well, people claim he, they did it in the United States, of course, right? Well, wait. I mean, come on, putting a bunch of 
uh, you mean like the cyber stuff? That's cyber stuff. Hundred thousand? No, it's uh, you know, supplying Trump with uh, with dirt on Hillary. Well, and it's, he- it's helping him win an election. Italy. Yeah, that's a whole yeah. other thing we've done in Russia before. That's a right. separate matter. We've done that in Russia. I mean, in terms of, but uh, but but just to finish, then uh, so that's Obama, um, and then Trump comes in and we start uh, sending weapons to. Ukraine, which I gather uh, turned them into such a, a formidable force that uh, Russia was having trouble holding even those borders. Now, again, that had been illegally established. I'm not, I'm not, you know, justifying the Crimea annexation or uh, the shit they were doing in the Donbass. I'm just saying, if you're Putin and you're already in that situation, and both of those things, by the way, were a reaction to 2014. But if you're already there, uh, and we're sending in more and more weapons. Um, it's like this already is the de facto NATOization of Ukraine, I'm seeing, and it's getting worse and worse. And by the way, have you noticed how many of these like generals and lieutenant colonels on cable TV are talking about Ukraine? They're saying, no, it's a good fighting force. I have trained them. And you're like, wait, we I didn't realize we were like, <laughs> it's like every commentator on MSNBC has personally trained Ukrainian troops. It's like, and 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 you know, Putin's looking at all of this. Again, not justifying anything. I'm just saying, you know, uh, I think you, you you really need to treat your nuclear powers with some degree of care, especially if you think maybe the guy's crazy. I don't. But if you think that, that's all the more reason not to be doing the shit we've been doing. Um, uh, do you th- what effect do you, do you think all the talk about uh, the possibility of a coup against Putin is having and also I want to give you an opportunity to say nice words about your friend, Mr. McFall, who got into some sort of trouble on Twitter for basically saying the Russian people are cowards. Now is the time for them to rise up against Putin and take to the streets there. He can't arrest all of you. This is like Martin Luther King attacking, uh, you know, moderates from the Birmingham jail for not standing up for civil rights. Actually, that part, and basically, that that, part was that during his... Came afterwards, right? That was during his non-apology apology. Right. So, but I do think it's a little much for him to 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 sort of to keep moral opprobrium on Russians who do would rather not like like not to be arrested and thrown in jail. But what's your line? Um, let's see. I'll read you the tweet first of all. The okay. actual tweet that he later deleted and not non-apologetically apologized for. She says there are no more, quote, innocent, quote, neutral Russians anymore. Everyone has to make a choice, support or oppose this war. The only way to end this war is if a hundred thousands, not thousands, protest against this senseless war. Putin can't arrest you all. So in other words, I take that to mean like, you know, don't complain about sanctions hurting you. You're not you're not innocent or, or, or neutral. If you could be out protesting, you're not. You know, Michael McFall has decided that you should spend the next few years in jail. Uh, and and there's just no excuse for not doing it. I'm sorry. It, it reminded me of that famous, uh, perhaps apocryphal Khrushchev speech. Does everybody know about this? Where he he's 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 destalinized Russia and he's giving a speech to the Politburo about all the crimes Stalin had committed. And he hears a voice saying, and where were you when these crimes were being committed? And he says, who is that? Show your face. Let's have to attach a name to that. Who said that? And there's dead silence. And he says, comrade, where you are now is where I was then. Uh, is it, this, this is probably apocryphal. It, it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> but where, where, where he was then is where any rational person probably will be, yeah. you know, now, uh, unless they're exceptionally brave, and there are people who are exceptionally brave, and we honor them, but it's a little, I just think it's a little much at this point, maybe there'll be a point later when it's not too much, to expect you know, masses of ordinary Russians to come out and risk Well, and just to be making the judgment from afar, and remember, McFall was ambassador to Russia, this is the thing that never ceases to to amaze me about this stuff. That gives him more credibility to make this judgment, huh? Well, he knows just, what people are up against. He's been beaten up. He saw his buddy uh, Nemtsov murdered. You know, he's seen I Navalny think all this stuff he, took a toll on him because he just he just says a lot of 
strange stuff about. I mean, I think he is so deeply emotionally invested in this uh, that he he tweets stuff like this. That's um, surprisingly empathetic and compassionate from you, Bob. No, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm empathetic toward everyone uh, cognitively. Um, and if if the final question on my list, or maybe another final question, is if we if Putin was killed by some guy pulling us on, is there any uh, hope that what the outcome would be better? I mean, it's not like democracy is going to break out suddenly. It would be well, an anti democratic you know, outcome. If, if it's right? an organized palace coup. In other words, it's an orderly succession. I assume it's going to be better because it's presumably guys who are saying right. this it, alienation from the West it, has gone too far. But it won't break. It won't be democracy now flourishes and oh, no. Tom Friedman's dream of a united Europe from the Urals to you know to the tip of Gibraltar uh, is well, those realized. Are, those are two kind of different issues. I, I mean, you can have a, a Russia that is peacefully integrated into the world economy and polity that isn't uh, a liberal democracy. Right, right. Okay, so it, it, it'll be better, but it won't be that, the, of course, the default position is democracy. Uh, no, I, I don't see any reason to think it would become, you know, the guys who would do the palace coup are not guys who would have any reason to think they could win an election, probably. Um, the, the uh, but I'd settle for less. I've been, I've been, uh, I should, we should, we've been doing this an hour. We probably should uh, settle for this being our first ever all foreign policy podcast because my dog is, he's, 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 excel he's, he's accelerating the, uh, he's escalating, as they say in uh, military circles. I, I, um, I, as I assumed it would be, and I'm sorry, I was late starting, so it's my fault. Um, well, no, we got in our hour. We're fine. We got, an hour, we got the parrot room. Now, but I do have, uh, yeah. I have a whole bunch of, non-foreign policy topics that I guess will be pushed into the parrot room, which is fine. Yeah, it's Gives fine. us something to talk about. You want to know what they are? Uh, I'm on the edge of my seat. State of the Union. Right. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, January 6th investigation. Good. Alleges they have Trump. I don't believe it. Uh, 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 findings about election fraud in Wisconsin that have given the... the uh, the right hope, uh, should they? Uh, um, the incredible New York Times, it, they put up a fraudulent Trayvon Martin video and they haven't taken it down. It's like false. Really? Why should we believe the New York Times? We can go into it. Um, uh, the latest economic report, wages seem to have stopped rising. Big news for Zamor in France. Japan gives up nuclear weapons. Or think no, he thinks of acquiring nuclear weapons uh, at, as a re result of all this. Sub Epstein news: uh, uh, the convoy uh, I thought it was going to fizzle out hasn't quite fizzled out. Uh, the uh, trouble for Rick Scott, uh, no trouble for Justice Jackson. Should there be? Uh, Jeez, uh, we got a whole bunch of stuff. Sounds like it. Uh, got the got the the lab leak report that supposedly was uh, the the fatal blow against the lab leak hypothesis. I failed to persuade Matt Iglesias. If it doesn't persuade Matt Iglesias, it, it who can it persuade? Cannot be a death blow. I agree um, with that. Now, I, I for my part, I, I I've been listening to this biography of Putin that I want to talk about. Fascinating character. I'm I'm to the part where he's about to be put in charge of Russia, but I have I have. I have learned some things about him that are uh, that I think are interesting. Um, the uh, let's see. Uh, um, I think that's. I don't know. I've been so. And maybe we. I oh oh. I've been promising my uh, contrarian take on the O.J. Simpson trial. I know not exactly in the news, but some commenters. I keep promising I'll do it. I think I will this time. I think I will. Um, I'm going to explain what I meant by natural organic borders. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll 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 look at some comment or comments and so on. Sounds like we got plenty, and uh, we should think a lot of, of we should think right? of some th something pop culture related. I just to say we have not a lot of gratuitous pop culture. 
Well, I had um, claimed I'd try, I, I would try to play Whiter Shade of Pale on my harmonica, but I don't think that's going to bring them through the doors. So I may put it, that, that totally will. You think so? But you want to put it off for a week because you haven't rehearsed. Even I have not played. rehearsed. I have, I have not. But, but that, that would, I mean, shit. What the hell? You should try it. And then like, it, then, then you'll be so bad that next week you'll want to do it having rehearsed. Right. And we can all admire. And so your we can build it growth. again. And the more times you build that, the more and how and how you how you wrote how you were you rose to the moment, Bob. You were you were matched for the moment. That's all we care about these days. Is are you matched for the moment? Is that a term? It's become a complete cliche of the Biden era. Yeah. Was Zelensky uh, matched for the moment? Yes, but Biden, but Biden's been talking about it. It's been a cliche in the Biden coverage for ever since he became president. Uh -huh. it, you know, Saki talks about it. You know, our, we 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 are matching the moment. Bullshit! You're pursuing the Democratic Party agenda. So anyway, if if, if wider shade of pale doesn't get them to patreoncom slash room, I'm just at a loss. I don't know. I don't know what it'll take. Uh, probably uh, you doing your version of. Uh, I don't know. You tell me. Um, not this week. Not this week. I'd okay. have to tune my guitar, which is not. Not into it. Okay. All right. Um, I should. My dogs haven't stopped. I should okay. go. Sorry. We'll, we'll see you in the parrot room. Okay. All right. Yeah.